History is built upon primary sources. First-person accounts especially offer glimpses of real events upon which good historians build compelling stories. But great historians go further than just building compelling stories. And historic Jamestown's Willie Balderson is one of those great historians. For decades, Mr. Balderson has been portraying Virginia's historic figures. He's been all over the Commonwealth portraying characters such as Civil War and War for Independent Soldiers, as well as John Smith's observant sidekick, Annis Toddkill, among others like Northern Neck merchant Thomas Matthews. Matthews' account of Bacon's Rebellion is one of Virginia's great primary historic sources, and historic Jamestown wanted to portray that narrative in a way that would bring the rebellion to life. In 1997, they asked Mr. Balderson, who was working at Colonial Williamsburg at the time, to put together the program today known as the Burning of Jamestown. Willie took on the task and has been staging the event ever since. That being the case, it was my very special pleasure to be Mr. Balderson, that is, Thomas Matthews, guest at Jamestown, and witness Matthews retelling the fascinating story of Bacon's Rebellion. Mr. Matthews even agreed to sit down for an interview. I trust my listeners will enjoy this fascinating 17th century merchant's account. Before we begin, do let me express my gratitude to Mr. Balderson and his staff. Their hospitality, as well as the hospitality of historic Jamestown, is world class. If you're in the historic Triangle area, do stop on by and witness their captivating work. You might even get to meet Annis Toddkill, or Thomas Matthews, or another of the many 17th century figures brought back to life on the island. I'm here with Thomas Matthew, a key figure in one of Virginia's major events in Bacon's Rebellion, as it's become known. Uh, in 1675, you and other Virginians witnessed omens uh, that seemed to forewarn coming events. Can you tell us what those omens were and what you thought they meant? It is, sir. It was most unsettling. Uh, the three together carried the greatest weight. Each individual it would have been a curiosity, but little else. Uh, the first, a comet that did appear, was in the summer of 75. Two years past now, it went. Uh, but it appeared every night for beyond a week in the southwest, upon the horizon at 5 and 30 degrees, streaming across the western sky like, like a mare's tail, and disappearing nigh on midnight uh, in the northwest, itself a curiosity and not much else. But just after that, there appeared swarms, great flocks of pigeons with such prodigious weight upon large trees that did break large branches that the fowlers did shoot a great many of them to eat of them. And uh, those that were ancient planters in this country, they reckoned back the last time they had seen this with an ominous presage as they spoke of it was back in 44 just to fall the last great Indian uprising. That was unsettling. But then after that, flays that would sting you, no larger than the, an inch in length, the size, the end of a man's little finger, they'd come out of spigot holes in the ground and did 
eat leaves, causing no other harm, uh, but uh, it were no more than a month, and they were gone. The appearance of these three together set the countryside uh, astir that some shift would occur, perhaps God's wrath, but they understood not fully what it were then. After seeing these omens, which situation took place on your land, actually, to confirm your worst fears were true regarding these strange phenomena? Indeed, a most lamentable occurrence. I, my principal seat, Northumberland County, upon the Patawomac River, but I own land on the westernmost county, uh, Stafford. And there, uh, my overseer there, Mr. Pimmett, he would desire us for some cattle, some kind we own, to have a herdsman hired. And a man came and recommended, his name Robert Hinn, and I trusted Mr. Pimmett's judgment upon it, thought no more of it, uh, but lamentably, in early July, on a Sabbath morning, there were neighbors that were bound for church, and they stopped at the cabin to see if they would take him up. And much to their horror, they made discovery of him laid thwart the threshold of his house with a Tamihak Indian hatchet wounds upon his head and shoulders and body. And nearby, an Indian, already dead, Hin, according to Mr. Piment, to Hin's last words when asked who had done these murders, he spoke of the dog Indians, D-O-G-U-E, the dogs, the dogs, and the four those that had come by could make any further inquiry, he expired. Now, in your writing later about the event, you said that this event, by degrees, Bacon's Rebellion came about. Can you explain what you meant by that? Indeed. Further toward the north, Massachusetts, there had been un unsettling with the Seneca Indians there. And uh, there were those that thought that perhaps the unrest there would spread down as fate would have it after it were revealed by Robert Hinn, his last breath, that it were the Dog Indians. Uh, the Stafford County Militia, both a troop of horse by Colonel Brent and a troop of foot, uh, Colonel Mason, they determined to call muster, they did, and they found the trail of the Dog Indians and followed it northward uh, several miles until they found where it had passed over the Patawomac River to Maryland. And they, in turn, by ferries, crossed over. They made discovery of a trail, and not beyond a mile it extended, and it divided, and with two in pursuit, a troop of foot and horse. They did, in turn, divide themselves, and no more than yards, hundreds, Beyond that, they discovered two cabins, and in the first, the troop of horse under Colonel Brent made call that those that had perpetrated the murder of Robert Hinn to come out, and in turn, a, a fire. There was, there was musket fire from within, and before it was all over, a number had been killed. I heard a number, perhaps as many as 12 others, the desperados, escaped. But the worst of it, when the dispatch of the musketry began at that particular cabin, those inside the other cabin that had been surrounded by Colonel Mason and his foot soldiers, they began to issue forth. And in the excitement, the militia, fearing for their own lives, fired upon those issuing forth out of that second cabin. And it was only after a goodly number had been killed that one made it to the arm to grasp it, Colonel Mason, and offered with the greatest of earnest that, that, that they were friendly Susquehannock Indians, Indians that we had been allies with for, for, for nigh on 20 years. And in turn, the burden then, by degrees, as I would speak, uh, the naturals of this country, they live by the law of Leviticus, an eye for an eye, life for life, and they set in motion reprisals, and 
within months, the entirety of the falls from from where the falls is upon the Rappahannock River to that of the James was on fire through the winter, much the same. And I suspect in the end we may never know how many lives were lost over several hundred. One of those key lives lost happened on Nathaniel Bacon's property, correct? Oh, indeed. Indeed. Uh, Mr. Bacon knew of this country, um, but uh, having relatives here, uh, uh, one of, of his own name, his, not his name's sake, but of his name, uh, Nathaniel Bacon, the senior, uh, was a councilman. And in turn, through his influence, the younger Master Bacon, uh, no more than uh, seven and twenty years, I've been told, uh, but he found himself well placed on the council, not having been in the colony for two years, at the curls, now on three quarters of the way from here, Jamestown, toward the falls of the James River. Uh, but uh, one morning, there was a raid, and his favorite servant, uh, an overseer, was killed. He took that to heart in a hard way. There were letters written to the governor. Uh, there were requests for forts to be built, that funding should be appropriated to see weapons and foodstuffs and, and supplies uh, for the, the, the colonists that far to the west, the frontier to set forth on expeditions to, to put the Indians down. And the governor, understanding that there are tributary Indians, those that each year pay tribute, they serve as a buffer. And that he was concerned a great deal that losing the respect of those Indians, much as the Susquehannocks had been turned by an era of haste, and perhaps by some bloodlust, that the same would happen. And he wanted that not, and he hesitated, as the strikes against Plantus continued. Mr. Bacon was moved and seduced by a mob uh, to accept a command of a, a militia to, to move against some, and that is lamentable. He starts to lead assaults and attacks against Indians surrounding the curls and, and further out. Or oh, indeed, those that were friendly. Hmm. Um, and he was, again, I believe in, in part, led by his own ambition. Ever, I've never met a man that lacked it. But the burden here, with the fear for hearth, home, wife, children, it, it is easy for me to see how, to see... Indians that had been placed by the governor specifically to serve as a buffer to more distant Indians, perhaps not so friendly, but to be envious of those lands that could be under till for tobacco. How, well, it is not but the truth that Mr. Bacon was led to believe that he should lead a rebellion against these Indians against the governor's better wishes, the governor having refused to grant him a commission to fight the Indians. And, and there it is, it is the matter of the fact. He first struck against uh, friendly Indians, the Appomattox, to the south side of the James River. He then was still marched far to the west, ten days' travel to the south and west. The Okaniche Indians, uh, they serve as a buffer betwixt uh, those to the east here, we, and the Cherokee, the Catawba, the creek, much further to the south and west. And it is a valuable trade there for furs, particularly beaver. And Mr. Bacon and his men, now on 200, attacked the Okaniche village at a time when they were just preparing to receive Governor Barclay's traders that held 
commissions to trade. And they came back having wiped out the entire village, coming back with furs, I've heard, in excess of three or four hundred pounds sterling of worth. So this is exactly what Governor Barclay was worried about. Oh, indeed, indeed. They, but they came back uh, to the approbation of those along the western frontiers as great Indian fighters. But they had attacked Indians that had been friendly to us, that the governor wanted to keep intact to protect us. Interestingly enough, during this time, yourself, Colonel Mason, Brent, and Nathaniel Bacon are all elected to the assembly. Indeed, uh, the, the governor a, called for an assembly. First one in a long time, wasn't oh, it? Indeed, indeed. Beyond 10 years. Uh, for my own part, it was not what I intended. Uh, I'm a merchant by trade, and I'm happy in that, that labor. To any profit I've had, I've adventured it into land uh, to the west in Stafford County, the aforementioned, for cattle and that sort. But owning to no small debt there and the influence of... Colonel Mason, uh, I consider a friend, he was very, very deliberate that I should stand election. Uh, now, I will tell you that without hesitation, I, I have never, ever held any interest in the, the complications, the intrigues of government. My hand's always busy in my own affairs, but because of those debt and the friendship to Colonel Mason, I stood for election, and much to my chagrin, I was elected. It surprised a great many to the east of the falls that in that same period of elections, for Henrico, Nathaniel Bacon, the great Indian fighter, was near unanimous elected to serve. Uh, the burden here is that the governor, after he heard about the raid on the Appomattox village, and then doubly so, after the Okanichi massacre, he had declared Nathaniel Bacon a rebel, a rebel to the king. How does that play out? You're here on, on scene to see what takes place. What happens? Bacon it, comes in. And... Indeed. I, well, I I'm, will be forthcoming. I was not here. Um, I, when he first had come down, the, the sheriff of, of James City, Sheriff Hong, he was here. And from what I understand from several that I trust, the governor had dispatched a ship to the far side of the James River, the south side, Swan's Point, with guns upon a cannon. And understanding that Master Bacon was coming down to take his seat, there was a trap laid, and the sheriff was delivered to him, Nathaniel Bacon, at gunpoint. He was brought here to the state house. And uh, the, the governor... From what I'm told, uh, said, Mr. Bacon, uh, I'm most pleased to see you. To which Bacon replied something of the, the turn of whatever please your honor. And he was put in chains, um, taken to the, the state house to a cell there. I arrived the next day by sloop, I don't know, a week to make my way from uh, my place, Cherry Point. Mount Tracy Parish, Northumberland County on the Potomac, a roundabout down the bay and then up the river here. Uh, winds did not prevail in our favor, uh, but I arrived to understand that bacon had been taken up uh, well enough. Uh, and the next day, just afternoon, we were above stairs, as I was a first-time Burgess, becoming acquainted with the business of government and where we would be seated and the tables and the like on the second floor of the state house. Directly below us, by this stairwell, is the general court. It's where the council meets periodically. And it was there that we were called down to and we all issued forth in. And the governor, after some words about the killing of the Susquehannock great men, amongst the other Susquehannocks that were put, put to death. There was a call that the governor, he evoked it, nigh on a, a biblical allegory. He, he spoke of a, there is joy in heaven when a penitent sinner 
comes forward and there's joy now. Uh, bring forth Mr. Bacon. And he was brought in in chains. He knelt before the governor in his usual seat there in the center of the, the general court. And he read from a paper uh, an apology. He took the charge of what he had done and he begged forgiveness from the king, from the governor, from God first, he said, and for the people for all that he had done. The governor, as we all looked on, for the longest while sat there, and it it was definitely not to hear. Governor finally shifted his way, and he said, God forgive you, I forgive you. Twice repeating that. God forgive you, I forgive you. God forgive you, I forgive you. And he fell silent again. Another minute. And then he spoke again, and he said, Mr. Bacon, if you can remain civil until the next quarter court, doubling that until the next quarter court, I shall restore you to your place here on the council. Now we were set forth, not one dared to even gasp or breathe. But once we were above stairs out of earshot, there was a great deal of discussion about how this had played, what the intent was. Later we learned that the governor thought to give Mr. Bacon that opportunity that perhaps those that had followed him would lessen their interest and then Nathaniel Bacon could be tried for treason. So you debated that for a while then in the assembly? Oh, indeed. We, the, the governor was very insistent that we truly did need to devise a militia bill for the defense of the Western aspect of the colony. Uh, the labor there, though, involved raising taxes. And with the renewed interest from the Marylanders in growing tobacco, a drought, burdens in England with a war with the Dutch, tobacco prices had fallen. Ordinary planters had not what they had had, half of it, five years before is profit, and in turn, to make the case that we would again raise the tariff for them to export the tobacco as a means to find funding for men in the field that would need be paid, for they would be away from their plantations. It was burdensome, troublesome. Uh, in the midst of it, there arrived a Pamunkey Indian, a queen of, of high standing, Kakakoeski who herself had seen a betrayal through that of her husband years and years ago, back in 56. There were a group of Indians, it was reported they were Senecas themselves, that had attempted a raid at the falls where Bird has a warehouse, Colonel Bird. And in the course of that action, those that had been of the militia, retreated, leaving the Pamunkeys to be slaughtered by them. Kakakoeski's husband had been killed in that engagement, and she never received recompense or an apology from the colony. We had summoned her to see if there would be an opportunity for the Pamunkeys now to offer guides into the brambles and back country of that region, and she was reluctant, she was indignant, and I fear I must admit for all the right reasons. But the end of it, like it or no, our speaker, deliberate, not on punishing, made demand of her, and she first said she would supply six. He harangued her for another ten minutes how important it was, how we should think not of just what had happened in the past, but how to improve that, and that we knew, he knew, she had easily 150 braves, men, capable of fighting alongside us. She finally reneged and said 12. And with that, 
with the greatest of dignity, but knowing she had been treated brutally, she raised herself up and walked off. about that same time, uh, Mr. Bacon knows what's taking place in the assembly. He decides he's going to leave. How does that take place? Indeed. Uh, well, the rumor spread that his wife had become ill. On the 12th of June, as I recall, he made his way back up river very hastily. There were those that later I heard rumors that some close to the governor perhaps had let it slip that the governor's reasoning for allowing him that hope that he would be seated against him again on the council was little more than to allow his followers to dissipate and then he would be tried on charges of treason and because of that knowledge he determined to take it into his own hands. He went up river feigning his wife's illness and from the 12th, 13th, 14th, I believe it's the 14th or 15th, rumors started to spread back down river that he was amassing an army that would march on Jamestown, that it was an army that would demand commissions to fight the Indians. The end of it, of course, is what we all know, I fear, happened on the 24th. He marched into town with an army of 400 when they gathered just out in the plain in front of the state house in the common, it was just after the drum had sounded for all the burgesses to be called back to the second floor of our meeting space as we had continued to try to negotiate how we could raise funds without raising taxes terribly for that militia bill. Uh, there was a commotion out in front and we all went to the windows, the dormers, to gaze out. Uh, Mr. Bacon had returned to Jamestown with his army of 400 to confront the governor. How does the governor react to that? What does Barclay do? Oh, he was in a fury. Governor Barclay was angered beyond words. We looked down from the second floor dormers and saw him stand upon the front stoop and bear his chest, quite literally, rip open his waistcoat and his shirt to his chest. Yet my eye was caught by Manus from my sloop with the greatest emotion waving from the back for me to come join them. And I trust those men. I made my way down below and around about, and I only have from second hand, but numerous. The exchange as it played out. If you care for that, I certainly will afford you what was related to me, uh, near the same words by all that bore witness to it. But as the governor ripped open his waistcoat and shirt, he said, Here, fair mark, before God, shoot. Let us settle this civilly amongst ourselves. To which Nathaniel Bacon, he replied in honest tones of contempt, as one put it, uh, No, if it please your honor, we will not harm a hair upon your head or any other man's. We are here for a commission to save ourselves from the Indians, which you have so often promised, and now we shall have it before we leave. This harangment apparently went on, Nay, we will, I shan't, for the minutes as I made my way down below. But I did see when I was with the miners and gazed back toward the state house, I watched the governor walk off. He keeps a private apartment, of course, at the end of the state house, no more than a coit's cast, 33 feet from the door that leads to our general court and the 
the stairwell that goes above to our chamber. But as he began to walk westward along the state house to his private apartment with the council members following behind, Nathaniel Bacon followed behind him, his arm, his right arm, swinging all akimbo from his hat to his sword to his hip, back to his sword to his hat. He stopped. He turned about, for he had arrived with two columns, rows of musketeers, but short muskets called fusils. Now these fusiliers had marched along behind him for a bit. He halted them as the governor and council continued to walk back to the governor's private apartment. But he turned to them and he gave them this oath. He said, damn my blood. I'll kill governor, council, assembly and all, and then sheathe my sword in my own heart's blood. And with that, he gave the command of those fusiliers to turn about, make ready, he said to them, take aim, and they raised the fusils, those short muskets, to all of those assemblymen in the second floor, gazing mm. out of those windows, turned about and continued then to follow the governor till he had disappeared inside. The fusiliers started to chant, we shall have it, we shall have it. Speaking of a commission to cease the disturbances on the frontier to, to have the commission to fight the Indians. Uh, one that they all knew, an ancient assemblyman, an ancient planter, thought it prudent this to open the window and take out a white kerchief and raise it as in peace, as in surrender, I fear. And he said to them, you shall have it, you shall have it, and it is what that caused them to law the fusils. The governor, the council, disappeared into the chamber. And Mr. Bacon came back. I will tell you that later we learned that Nathaniel Bacon had given an order as he was walking behind the governor with those outrageous gestures, antics of his hand, his right hand, his sword hand, from his sword hilt to his hat, to his hip. He had given a command that had he drawn his short sword, that was the signal that they were to fire at those faces gazing at the second floor. So near was a total mask of all of them in that moment of phonetic fury had he but drawn his sword. Save that Pacific handkerchief wave. Twas at that moment that all assembled, those of the town watching at a distance, those gazing out of the windows, that this was beyond repair now. So from that standpoint, what happens next? He's got his commission. Barclay's still very upset. He's certainly not supportive of this. Indeed, he was forced to grant the commission to keep this mob from perhaps the next would have been bloodshed. It was right. so close. That in turn, the governor determined that the safest thing for him was to grant the commission. The troops under Nathaniel Bacon disappeared. Mr. Bacon determined that the easiest course of action, as it had played, played well for him before, was to find the closest friendly Indians and attack them, and then by turn find the next group closer in, further out, and the next group and he determined to go after the Pamunkey Indians that had been allied since 47, 46 and 47, the last treaty. They had ventured themselves into a, a stream that turns in, eventually into the Pianki Tank River called the Dragon, the Dragon Run, for it turns itself as the ancient Britons. With swampy wall. area, right? Oh, indeed, yes. indeed, uh, filled with brambles and briars. Uh, but the monkeys knew the ways of that place. 
and they disappeared into it. Mr. Bacon, toward Gloucester County, determined to find them and uproot them and destroy them. It, the governor at this juncture went to Gloucester, raised the standard of the king, and I've been told as many as a thousand. Others have told me six or seven hundred of the local people turned out, and he pleaded with them not to be persuaded, but they were all feared of what Mr. Bacon and those already following him might do, the reprisals, and they turned and walked away from the governor, leaving him there alone with several council members. At this, he determined to abandon the place. He went over to the eastern shore, thinking perhaps he could raise an army there. Mr. Bacon, hearing of this, once sent over a vessel to capture him, failed. And a second time, it was in late August that they went. The governor was able, with allies, to take that vessel, a small sloop, and another vessel armed, and he determined with that victory to come back here to Jamestown and try to take his colony back. It was in the summer as well that Mr. Bacon announced his declaration of the people. That was in large part what truly angered the governor. He said he would, Mr. Bacon in his declaration, said he would grant freedom to any indenture, any enslaved, any servant, any bondsman, who would take up arms with him against the tyrannical governor, William Barclay. Do you think he would have done that, or would he just use this to try to gain more backing to fight Barclay? It is hard to say. He sure. was well received by the commons. He truly was. He truly was. Now, as all these events are unfolding, where are you during this time? What's your part in all of this? I went back to my place, yeah. and as... It was when he had been taken up early upon. We had heard bits and pieces that there had been some incursions against Indians in the spring of the, of, of 76, but we didn't know anything about it other than just bits and pieces that unfolded very rapidly. Sure. And then the assembly was dissolved also. Indeed. This period. Indeed. So essentially it, it's a full-on rebellion. There's chaos everywhere. Indeed. Mr. Bacon didn't just attack naturals in the area. He, he also started to attack other population, other citizens as well, correct? Indeed. He turned against those that had been loyal to the governor with a vengeance. Any of the councilmen that uh, had shown sympathy to the governor, he made sure that uh, he, his men, his lieutenants, liberated any of the cellars that had libations, any stores of food, cattle were slaughtered to feed his army. Uh, his army that grew considerably as he announced that declaration for the people in July. Uh, but it created incredible deprivation across the countryside because many of the governor's lieutenants, many of his loyal, had been kind to the middling sort and the lesser sort and in turn, uh, without the foodstuff that had been given to the poor, the entirety of the countryside near failed. And you, you had mentioned at this point, however, Governor Barclay does come back to Jamestown. Mr. Bacon wasn't very happy with that. No, no. The, after the declaration of the people, uh, Nathaniel Bacon determined to restore himself to his fight against the friendly Pamunkey Indians deeper and deeper into the dragon, the dragon run swamp. The governor, gaining an opportune with the capture of two sloops to the eastern shore, Accomac County, he determined that perhaps he should now, with that victory, restore himself here to the capital, raise his standard, the king's standard again, and in turn amass an army, or at the very least, to 
be prepared to defend the capital. He arrived back here on the afternoon, evening, as I understand it, of September 6th. Word through spies, those that were watching all near and about the neighborhood of Jamestown, allowed through dispatch Mr. Bacon to, to know that the governor had come back. And this infuriated him. He stopped his activity in the Dragon, called again for a larger militia force from Gloucester County, marched his way across York County, New Kent County, and in turn found himself just across the Isthmus from Jamestown, where the ruin can be seen of the old glass house of a much earlier time when that attempt was made to find a product to be sent back to England. It, Mr. Bacon set up cannon there, and it was a jarring thought that he had taken the wives of the most prominent of the followers of the governor and placed them betwixt his artillery pieces. He, in turn, could fire them toward the town. But those defenders here, loyal to the governor, dare not fire back for fear that they would pierce the breast of those that they held the greatest love for. Uh, this was but a day and a half, and I suspect, though it was never spoken to me, that mayhaps some of his lieutenants thought that ill-advised, and in turn, they were set at their liberty, those wives, and in turn, a back and forth over several days. Sallies uh, went back and forth. Uh, uh, a handful, lamentably, were killed on both sides. Mm. Uh, but in the end, on the morning of the 19th of September, the governor held a council, and holding that council, determined that perhaps with shelling imminent, that it would be better for the town to save the town if he were to retire from it. And he loaded all of his followers himself in uh, several ships, and they sailed down the James River only in the afternoon then to discover through our observers that Mr. Bacon triumphantly entered the city. They held a council of war, again I was told, in the church, and they determined not to allow, as it was told to me, that rogue, speaking of the governor, to have his capital back. They would destroy it. The burden of the church of the state house, brick buildings, but soft oyster shell, lime mortar, holding soft clay bricks together with wooden roofs, wooden suspension, and that great heat, pushing the heat down, then compromised the bricks, so in turn the structures had to be raised. But they just they set fire. I'm told Bacon himself set fire to the church. They destroyed the state house. Uh, they destroyed public buildings, private buildings that mattered none. Uh, two of, of Mr. Bacon's lieutenants, prominent gentlemen of this town, Mr. Drummond and Mr. Lawrence, they destroyed their houses here. All in a show of solidarity to the cause of this rebellion against who they considered to be a corrupt governor. Now at that point, however, it seems like the rebellion is going to move forward in Mr. Bacon's favor, and then it quickly unravels. Can you explain what happens there? I suspect his ambition, again, Mr. Bacon's, was his own fall. He determined, as he had not had great success in his war against the Pamunkey Indians, to go back there to Dragon Run. It was rumored that from the beginning of October, he had not a stitch of dry clothing on him for three weeks, waiting, sleeping in the mire and muck, trying to find these Indians that went deeper and deeper into an environment that they knew, that they had been raised with, that they had hunted in, that they were familiar with. But those from the eastern counties appeared, all of it, one brambled, exactly like another. 
dead. They were all but lost. And in the midst of this, Mr. Bacon, perhaps it was consumption. Perhaps it was some sort of ague. But he became very ill, fevered. And he was taken from there to higher ground, Mr. Pate's house in Gloucester County. And there he expired. It was said from the bloody flocks, his favorite oath was damn my blood. The governor, Mm -hmm. upon hearing this, perhaps he died from the bloody flocks and a gross infestation of lice. It was said that his body, his skin continued to move even after he died. The infestation of lice so thick from having been out of doors without a change of clothes, but to put other clothes on top when his shirts became so matted against him. But the governor was said to have thought that Mr. Bacon finally, by God, was blessed with his wish that his blood was damned. So what does Governor Barclay do after this news reaches his ears? Oh, indeed, he at that point saw this for what it was, a turning point. None of his lieutenants had the charisma, had the inertia, had the sway over the common people, as did Nathaniel Bacon. And in turn, with that momentum slowed, Nylon ceased. The -hmm. governor took the upper hand, and those that had perhaps been upon the fence or leaning toward Mr. Bacon very quickly fell back to the governor's side. His militia increased substantially, and he declared war on any that had taken arms against him. There were private hangings, public hangings. The governor served as both sheriff, jury, and executioner. So he came through, he, he rounds up everybody, and in a very brutal manner, ends the rebellion. Oh, indeed. But was that well received in England? Absolutely not. No, uh, Judas Prudence, it, 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 there was not fair justice, prudent right. justice. There was not a trial, save right. that of the governor. He had a list of those mm-hmm. that were highest ranking that had served Nathaniel Bacon, and he set his lieutenants, the governor did, to seek them out, hunt them down, right. and within hours they were tried of treason and hung. No witnesses called. In a, in a manner that does make Governor Barclay look like the tyrant that Nathaniel Bacon was painting him to be. Indeed. And it is lamentable that, I think. Right, right. Both were driven by ambition. Both were driven to be well received. Both believed that how they approached the treatment of the naturals, the Indians, was best. To, to think that Mr. Bacon held with him a large number of people that wanted to see the destruction of the Indians, that driving them off their land into the interior. How that could be of of, of good service, I I know not. But the governor, being reluctant to treat any of the Indians along the frontier with indifference, that was burdensome too. Right. He was overly cautious, I think. And it cost us the capital. Absolutely. Jameson never recovers from that, does it? It, The state house is rebuilt... But you know, there's a recodification of law. There's a, an effort to encourage people to look beyond where they are. The laws toward indentures were stiffened. The laws sure. toward the enslaved were stiffened. All as a reaction to all of the events that were tied together with this. Indeed, the unrest from the lowest point to see a number of people that appeared to be unresponsive to the needs, the drought, the omens, right. all played in to those, the lowest, low-born, and those that needed the greatest encouragement. Mm-hmm. But they were allowed amongst themselves to stew and to consider the only way they saw out. And the position of the governor changes as well, correct? Governor Barkley, what happens to him? And then uh, to, to answer this question, the change comes, 
He's replaced by King Charles, correct? Oh, indeed. He had sent a letter in the summer when he was in Accomac on the eastern shore informing the king that he felt that he could no longer hold the colony, that it was in open rebellion. I, this was after he had raised his standard at Gloucester, right. and they all just walked away. And in response to that, the king sent 1,100 soldiers under Colonel Jeffreys to put down the rebellion. There was a full investigation and inquiry. And in the midst of that, the, the governor thinking he should seek out the king, he left. He arrived in England in June, late June of 1677. A very tired man. He'd been worn out from fighting in the fall of the previous year to trying to 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 apprehend those that had supported Nathaniel Bacon. And in turn, this aged, tired man, broken in so many ways, he died while waiting for his audience with the king. He died never, in London. Never got to see him. No. And his replacement here in Virginia, he doesn't rule the colony in the same way that Governor Barclay had the previous 15 years, 16 years. Yeah. Uh, so it's, Virginia very much so enters a new era. The colony it, changes. It's a codification of laws that reduces the amount of, of latitude that the lesser so mm -hmm. the poor have. And the laws are tightened. Now, as a citizen of that time period, does that affect you in a positive or a negative way? I'm a Probably merchant. Probably takes some time to oh, see. Oh, indeed, indeed. I'm a merchant. The war with the Dutch was of a greater influence to me. Mm. My economy not based on tobacco. It will, I suspect, be to the future to negotiate better equal standing betwixt us and the Marylanders for the price of tobacco. Sure. Uh, that is the greatest incumbent I hear is the price per pound. Sure. And as more grow, the Carolinas are now growing tobacco, uh, there's a glut in the market. Certainly. And in turn, it, it is hard to raise yourself if you have been an indented servant for years and you're released from your bonds. Now as a freeman, you have a few acres. And what was when you first were bound seven years before? You saw when you started an opportunity at the end of seven years and then three or four more to build yourself up. But when you get to the end of your term, what was there is now gone. Your ability, your opportunities have certainly changed. This, oh, this rebellion does not help in any way. No. Well, Mr. Matthews, I, I wish the best of luck to you. Most kind. I appreciate your, your insight into this pivotal event. Most kind. Godspeed to you, sir, in your travels. Thank you again for supporting the podcast. It's greatly appreciated. Please continue to spread the word and help this colony to keep growing. Start by following us on your favorite podcast provider, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and visit the website. Sharing episodes and other work is the best way to expand the community. Another way to greatly aid the podcast is by providing feedback on iTunes. If you have yet to do so, please take a few minutes and leave us a comment. Doing so helps bring exposure in the iTunes network. It also helps me to know what I need to improve on in future episodes. If you would like to support the work financially, please consider supporting the podcast on Patreon. Links can be found on the website, or one can visit the campaign at patreon.com forward slash VAHISPOD to see the choices and rewards being offered for your generosity. And please, join me next time as we continue walking through Virginia's history. Ooh,
Bad do do bad, this be the do do zing, bazing.